Okay, you guys. <laughs> Bear with me here. Uh, I am, I guess I'm, whatever gave me the fever before, I'm having it again. Oh my god, though. So, bear with me. While I talk to that guy, Stuart, or whatever, Stewie, from Malcolm in the Middle. Which is actually on point with what I'm about to talk about, which is interesting. So in order to tell you this whole story, I have to back up to where, to college. When I was 19, uh, which is a year after moving out of my dad's house, my denial started breaking as survival wasn't as pertinent to depending on my dad. There was degrees of denial that I had to, felt I had to. Um, have in order to survive. And um, when I was in college, I guess it was a safer space. So my denial started breaking about half a year after leaving my dad's house. That my dad was not a good guy. And I woke up and I couldn't breathe. It was a psychosomatic panic reaction. I didn't know it was happening at me at the time. But I think it I felt a pressure on my chest and I, I couldn't catch my breath. And all I could get out because people were kind of like, Well what the hell's going on? was that something's not right with my dad. This is the only sentence I could get out. And then I just left it at that. I didn't explain any more to anybody. And they didn't really get what that meant, and I didn't really explain more than that. And so during the summer, I had to go live back at my dad's house, which I really didn't want to do. And at the time, which is odd. I I can't explain why he was nice about it, but at the time, I asked for a therapist because I was pregnant. I was experiencing a lot of just tough emotions. And she told me, I mean, I was still kind of in denial about a lot of things. And I, t I didn't say a bunch of stuff. I didn't talk about a bunch of stuff. But from what I mentioned about my father, which was super limited, I don't want you to go in there, please. No, because you made a mess. Yes. Um. Um. <laughs> Bear with me here. I'm trying to function. Okay. Um. She told me, your father shows a lot of red flags of a predator. And I was kind of defensive. But I listened and I kind of wasn't totally sold on it. I think I still love my dad and it was really the only active family at the time. And I kind of needed that not to be true. And... It freaked me out, and she said, do you have a lock on your bedroom door? I said, no, I don't. It's the only bedroom in the house that doesn't have one, actually. You get, yeah. And... No, don't go that way, go around. No, honey, you don't need to go that way. Don't go around, I assure you. And, um... Okay, that bird. Don't go that way, honey. It's gonna frustrate you. No, sweetheart. So, this is like tape number four of trying to make it because of his little shenanigans. Here we go. Okay. So, based on what I told her, she said, I think you need to barricade your door at night. 
And truth be told, I could no longer sleep. And I didn't sleep a wink for 13 nights. And I was just stare at the ceiling, listening to the house, being terrified of, I think, exactly what I knew, that someone could hurt me, that somebody was hurting me. Um, and I think I was really scared of that. I know it was. And then that's when I had my suicide attempt was after that. Because your mind doesn't work right without sleep. And it was really kind of sick. My dad, just to briefly touch on that, he's like pretty out of it though. He was like, as you guys heard, right? I took <laughs> some, my dad doesn't have any thing interesting in the house, except for antihistamines, apparently, but I didn't fuck with those, because why would I? But, um, and so I just took what was in the house, and he saw that, and my, I guess, yeah, and he was like, oh, now I have to get you Pepto-Bismol. He's pretty out of it, though. And he said that the look on my face said, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and so he took me to the hospital, and the whole way it was very odd. He was complaining about money, and he was like, this is going to cost me five, he always said this, it's not true. This is going to cost me $500 just to walk in the door. He took me to the free clinic. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. This is the guy who clears over 200 grand a year. <laughs> His daughter's suicidal. I go to the free clinic. Okay. Um, and truly what he was kind of saying was, on the whole ride there, that I was going to cost him money, but I think what he was also saying is, if I were to die, he would lose money. And he didn't care about my life. He did later. He, he, he showed remorse for being like that, but, well, it, yeah, it was... It literally was so shocking to me that I stopped thinking about my pain and just tripped on how weird my dad is. And I was just staring at him like, there's something actually wrong with your dad, dude. So, and the reason that I did that is the same thing. I realized I don't, I couldn't, at the time, I couldn't, I explained it with terms like surrogate spouse. And those were things I was learning at the time. Surrogate spouse, I felt that my dad was kind of turning me into sort of like a, a dating prop in this weird way. I know it's weird to say, but I just got this sexual edge and this kind of like, he saw qualities in me that he had liked in his wife, you know, and he was saying inappropriate things at the time, like, I like when we go out to eat because people think that we're dating and you're attractive, so that makes me look good. And I was like, ew. It was so fucking gross, though. And trust me, I gave him hell for that. I gave him hell for a bunch of shit. Because at that point, I was starting to speak up more. At 18, I wasn't saying shit. At 19, I was like, ew. At 20-something, I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Do you hear your shit? Are you Asperger's? What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Do you listen to the words that you say? Like, it would change, dude. As I got more independent. But all this to say that, um... So... When I was 19, and I was living at my dad's house, prior to the attempt, something happened. This is, I think, what pushed me too far. And having not slept, I called my friend in the middle of the night. She was nice enough to answer. It was like 3 in the morning. Dude. I, I couldn't sleep. And I was whispering, but he has house phones everywhere. I don't get cell phone reception. so very limited. You have to drive up the road to get it. And so I used the, cell, the house phone and he was listening. And I told her, because I heard him walking towards the wall and then I pick up the receiver later. And I was like, shit. He does. That. And I told her, I, all I could say is something's wrong with my dad. Dude, I don't feel safe. Something's wrong with my dad. I kept saying just that. Like I couldn't, something's really wrong. And, oh my god, so the next morning, so my room is the only one with blinds, but they were open. And the next morning, oh my god, it's so hot right now. The next morning, 
Dude, he looks straight up like a serial killer. I'm in no way joking. He was staring at me outside. He never did this. Staring at me outside the blinds like he was gonna kill me. Though, like I'm serious. Like, like crazy. Like, duct tape, back of the car. Like nut bag. Like total psycho. And I went, well, okay, Tara. Look, this guy, if he was gonna kill you, he wouldn't be leering at you through the blinds. He'd be killing you. Okay. So I was like playing to his denial. That's what you guys have done for years. And so I got up and I just went into the shower like everything's normal. And I don't normally lock the door, but I just felt like I should lock the door. Thank God I fucking did because he was trying to get in. And I was in the shower. So, and I still to this day can't tell you what would have happened had he gotten in. But I do know this. I was naked, I was cornered, and he was being really aggressive, okay? And I can't tell you if he was going to just yell at me, if he was going to assault me, if he was going to sexually assault me. I don't know, okay? I'm, I don't know. I really don't know. And that kind of makes it scarier that I, I don't know. Like, if, picture this. If, if he thinks that I knew everything, he might not care if I know that he's a rapist because he might already think that I know that. I didn't quite pull that together. I just said something's wrong with him. I don't feel safe here. So, um, so, yeah, he, so fast forward, I have that attempt and I move out. I move in with my friend and his, his grandma. They were hilarious together. <laughs> his super Jewish grandma, my super Jewish friend, and they were fucking hilarious. They were like straight up comedy. Okay, and she, yeah, she kind of guessed. She kind of guessed it wrong. She says, the dad touching her? And we just kind of like, didn't say anything. And, um, she was like trying to figure it out. I wasn't there too long. It was a couple weeks, but still. And, uh, so, fa flash Flash forward. It's been a day. <laughs> you should see me trying to find stuff. I'm like, what? Where? It's like weird though. So. Flash forward a couple years. And I go back to living at my dad's house at this point. And it's always economic. It's always an economic reason that I go back. And so I went back there after LA and having lost my company and my <laughs> relationship and my house and it's fucking hell so they sent me hard and getting ripped off for three million dollars that you still don't believe it happened getting ripped off for a TV show so I was at a low low as you can imagine and I was smoking a lot of pot at the time. You know, my dad's a pot dealer, so he just gave me a big old fat sack. And I would just do that. Just, like, in the driveway. <laughs> I would just lay on my back in the driveway and watch the hummingbirds and get stoned. I did not know what else to do with my time. That town is hella boring, and I'm trapped on a mountain. So, I hadn't... I don't even know anybody since my first high school there, so it's like, God. so, anyways, ah, a few people, but a few and far between, so, I just start dating to get out of the house, I don't know what to do, anyways, this is like not a good idea, by the way, and, um, so, the point is, that when I, uh, my dad doesn't like me to smoke pot in the house, but I, I was scared to go outside because it's scary at night. It's like out in the middle of fucking nowhere. There, there are wildebeest. Like, I'm not kidding. All kinds of shit. So I stepped into the bathroom to smoke a joint and run the vent so he didn't know. I had a full-blown PTSD reaction. Uh, un it's very unusual to have one of this magnitude and I had a full blown PTSD flashback to my dad trying to get in the bathroom 
And so what did I do? I had that before I lit the joint. So I went, I'm kind of like, how do I say this without sounding like a douchebag? I'm like a white girl shamanic, okay? So my solution is get into it. Don't run away from it, get into it. And weed helps me do that. Doesn't remove me. Oh no, it makes it scarier in a lot of ways because now you're in it. So I opted for my own psychedelic experience to get over this. I was going to anyway. And, um, and I sat there smoking that joint in full-blown PTSD, sitting in that memory in the very room. And my reaction was really odd. I walked, but it makes total sense it's because my denial is breaking. And I walked into the living room. See, it makes total sense. As I started to realize that my denial was coming down, that my father is a dangerous man. He's so docile, it's hard to know. A dangerous man and, and not right in the head. Um, as that started to break, as I was sitting in this memory, <laughs> sweetheart, um, <laughs> so cute. Um, getting him to play over there. And uh, he's a bit reluctant, but he does it. And so I went into the living room and I said if there's a ghost up here and I was smoking a joint now I probably look neutral about this event truth be told I was terrified had a ghost shown up I would have eat like a mouse ran out of the fucking building and never come back but I think why I did that was because I was starting to make the connection that my father was the ghost. Not that he was the ghost, but something about his shadiness is what is going on. And so I wanted to know once and for all if there was a fucking ghost. And you guys called this schizophrenia. I want to know why you have cameras. But the reality is I was, it was really healthy. I was in a state of PTSD, full blown, but, and I was dumb, but I wasn't out of it. It made total sense. I just wanted to know once and for all, if there's fucking something here, show the fuck up already. Or shut the fuck up. And nothing showed up, as you can imagine. And I think this moment was really powerful, actually. I think it was really important. And you guys called it schizophrenia. And it actually is one of my healthier, more brave moments, which is kind of ironic. So I'm explaining this to you so that you know.